So, my name is Joseph Ventel. I'm a Masters of Research student at the University of York. My project this year is on uh, the Park Hill Flats in Sheffield, which I'm sure many of you will have heard of. Um, I'm looking at community, digital placemaking, uh, immersive storytelling and identity. Um, I just want to start by saying thank you to David and Harold, who isn't here today, for letting me contribute to the session. Um, so, through working at Park Hill Flats on, um, exploring, on a project exploring heritage-led urban regeneration, uh, we begin to have conversation with the residents there about using immersive experiences to facilitate placemaking activities. Uh, the residents already lead tours of the building and already are starting to develop notions of identity and a sense of place within Park Hill. Um, through storytelling, the community is advocating for itself its own notions of identity and their cultural heritage. And it is one that sits largely outside the usual frames of heritage within local, regional and national policies. Um, Knowledge of the past can empower this community to control the way that, uh, that identities and heritage are presented within Park Hill um, by giving this community the power to drive the outcome of the project. They can tell the stories that they want to tell. So going back to what David said at the start, I'm, I'm sort of coming from this, from the perspective of the question, does knowledge of the past give power to the communities and add notions to uh, identity and cultural heritage? And so what I'm arguing is that but it's important to let them have control of that power and through facilitating that, that's when uh, they can add to notions of identity. Okay. Um, sorry. So I'll begin today by discussing the different funding streams for my own project um, and the earlier small projects, which which um, Kat Cooper, who was supposed to be here today, but unfortunately she's got uh, something else she's involved in uh, that she was involved in before, as well as Don Hadley, another one of my supervisors, and Nick Bax, who works for a company called Human. Um, and then I'll be looking at... Uh, sorry. And then I'll be bringing in my own project at Park Hill um, and this sense of giving the community the power to be able to control their own knowledge of the past. Okay. Okay, so just looking at the different funding streams we've got, we arrived here via a number of small different projects uh, focusing on digital interventions supporting heritage-led urban regeneration. Uh, they've been going since around 2018. So Dawn Hadley, one of my supervisors, in collaboration with Nick Fox at Human and with colleagues at the University of Sheffield, uh, secured an initial grant from the AHRC uh, to consider digital approaches to heritage-led urban regeneration. Uh, then on Dawn's move to York, uh, the University of York, she then employed Dr. Kat Cooper, who started to look at immersive experiences and started to work with uh, the Residents Association at Park Hill. Uh, so together they applied to XR Stories, which is where I come in. Uh, that was my MRS studentship, which I've just started this September and October. Um, and the project aims to create an immersive storytelling experience, which will facilitate community and digital placemaking uh, with the residents there. Okay. So to begin with, just going to look at the initial project which started all this, which was with Sheffield C uh, Castle and community involvement. So this was sort of before my time. So this was sort of Kat's uh, element of the presentation, but I'll try and cover it as best I can. So through the initial AHRC Immersive Experiences uh, grant, the project were with community groups, uh, the Friends of Sheffield Castle. Uh, this project created an AR experience of the Sheffield Castle to demonstrate the potential capacity of uh, immersive technologies to harness the power of cultural heritage, uh, community engagement, and the transformative potential of the creative industries to inform urban regeneration strategies and drive economic growth. Uh, the AR experience was popular, but highlighted a number of concerns in how the output, how these outputs engage with the community groups. Um, they are often created for, specifically that, they, that often the community groups have very little say in the process. Um, and their long-term use has a limited lifespan. So with Dawn's move to York, she secured follow-on funding to consider the community engagement further, and it was at this point we started working with the Residents Association at Park Hill. Okay, so here, Kat interviewed a, a series of other s similar projects. Oh, move, oh, sorry, yeah. So at this point, Kat interviewed a number of similar projects um, to sort of look at what contributed best practice when we're looking at a digital engagement and community engagement um, and how community groups can successfully advocate for involvement in these types of projects. Um, we consider a range of projects driven from both academic and industry leads and the same successes and failures were consistent across the, the board there. 
Um, in very simple terms, while community groups are very enthusiastic about the creation of these kinds of projects um, and can see the value in their creation, they are often created as a top-down approach. Uh, and as we'll go and see a little bit, that is often the case at Park Hill as well. Um, this results in their involvement often only in the final stages of production uh, through testing of prototypes or as mechanisms for continued uh, planning consultation. However, this is this has a lot to do with the funding of the, uh, these sort of organisations, and that was the primary limitation as well, which is what they found. So this has got uh, this is an impact on the early stakeholder engagement that had to be cut short. Uh, choice over outputs was li limited to existing ex expertise with the vision of academic or industry partners, uh, and there was a limitation through the access to hardware and software and the longevity of that for the for the community. Um, and at that point, uh, Cat interviewed Calvium, which is sort of an industry lead in digital engagements with communities. Um, and they highlighted that community engagement was often dictated by the developer or clients and would only be brought in at the stage they considered to be important. So it was at this point they started to work with Park Hill. Um, and so I'll just introduce you to Park Hill to you. I'm sure many of you will know it, but it's a very contentious site. It's probably one of the most contentious sites in this country. So it was the 1950s and early 1960s social housing estate. Um, it was slated for demolition in the 1990s, following a period of industrial decline, Thatcherism and unemployment in the late 1970s and early 1980s. Uh, oh, sorry, and 1980s. But ultimately it was saved by English Heritage and it was listed in 1998, which helps us to think about how, how listing actually can have such a powerful perspective uh, powerful force on perception uh, for the heritage community and for communities more generally. Um, in sorry, So following that listing, it was then un, un, uh, taken on by Urban Splash, which are a sort of radical redesign uh, specialist, um, and they're still going, working with the project. They're currently sort of in the latter phases of releasing the second phase of the project, and, they've, and uh, phase one of Park Hill has been open for quite a long time now. But Park Hill in general has drawn a wide spectrum of opinion from its inception up to present day. And these opinions vary from things uh, from oral testimonies when it was first opened to the, uh, quotes like, it was a fantastic place to live and I only have good memories of it. It was a community where everyone knew each other. But then you also have testimonies such as, the flats are an eyesore on the landscape and illustrate the failure of socialist housing policies of the past. And Park Hill now is home to a diverse community of residents and is in an active uh, process of placemaking. For Park Hill, uh, for, from what I have seen Park Hill, uh, off Park Hill, there appears to be three distinct phases um, for the, the different residents there. So we have this rise when it was first opened, where it received huge popularity. And we can see that from uh, the super flats of the future, which was from the star uh, in the early 1960s. And this, it received a huge popularity and the people that lived there in the 1970s and 1960s appear to have a really strong strong love for the building and that's where that comes from uh, and then we have the fall of park hill which which you also get newspaper articles like this a cry of despair from the from a prisoner of park hill and so we get this stems from the the troubled times that it had where there was unemployment crime depression um which came to putting problem families in there and not taking it seriously as a social housing estate. And then now we have this new generation of residents, as we, and this is that's the newest version of Park Hill there, that's phase one on, on the board, who are uh, students, young professionals, but there are also social housing residents there. So there's sort of three distinct phases of what's happening at Park Hill, and they all sort of create their own sense of place. And while they do interlink, they are vastly different as well, I think it's, it's important to remember. So I'll just talk a bit about Stories in the Sky, which is my own project. Um, so I'm working with the Residents Association at Park Hill to produce digital software, which can be utilised as part of ongoing tours of the building. And we are aiming to create something that is of use to the, to the residents there and is driven by what they want to see. And this comes down from that, the research that uh, Kat and Donald took with um, the top-down approaches and it's our drive to scrap that and, and work specifically with the Residents Association and, and create something that's going to be of use to them and will impact their community. Um, so from the early interviews of the project, there's been a great sense of enthusiasm for the software and to tell their diverse stories of experience. By focusing on the storytelling of the site, we are aiming to draw out this intangible heritage, which 
uh, for modernist buildings and for brutalist buildings is often, often what's important about that. It's not actually the tangible elements that are important. It's the, those intangible stories of experience and, and the regional identities that are created within the building. It's really important. Uh, so far, I've had conversations with res residents and started to begin interviews, which will continue throughout January. Um, these interviews uh, focus upon what the residents want and what, what the locals want to share, their knowledge of the site. Uh, what does the com community need and introducing them to the digital software. So at this stage as well, we're not actually sure what software we're going to create. It, it might be augmented reality, it might be virtual reality. But I think it's really important at this stage to not choose where that's going to go because we don't know what story they, stories they want to tell and what, what will be the most impactful and effective. Uh, my aim is to gather those stories and then hold focus groups and workshops to sort of bring together those ideas and create something that, that everyone can agree on and everyone's happy to do. Um, and ultimately, as I was saying before, with the, the three different distinct phases of residence, I think my job as a facilitator is going to be particularly difficult because I don't think there's going to be it's, it's not a simple, everyone's got the same identity. It's actually quite a complex situation. Um, right. But from my early research, and I've been doing this since October, so I've still got a lot of sort of research to go. But one thing that's been particularly noticeable is there's a lack of communal spaces on the current site. Um, and so on the previous site, we can see on this board, this is a plan from 1961. Um, and on the site, they on the site as a whole, there used to be four shops. Uh, it's what, four pubs, 30 shops, a dentist, a podiatrist, uh, pretty much you name it, it was there. Um, and so what I've found is that a lot of the oral testimonies, a lot of the stories that were created in the previous Park Hills are intrinsically connected to these spaces. And, that, and that's a, there's identities tied to those spaces and I think that's really important. But then if we look at the site today, there's a bit of a really, really easy spot the difference because it's nothing's the same. So the only thing that's the same in that picture is the shell of the concrete. So there we can see a school playground behind that was a pub, a dentist surgery. So the, there's a lot missing and there's a lot of sort of lacking communal spaces which will help this community to thrive in its own way. Um, so at the moment, there's a, an art space uh, and a cafe. But I found from speaking to the residents, there's some hes hesitancy to use those spaces because, for one, not everyone's into art and there's not a lot of space in, in, that, in that environment. But then the cafe, they find quite expensive and they sort of, some people think it's great, some people don't. And there needs to be more of a general space for those people, uh, a push for a visitor centre. That's the sort of perception that I've taken from it and I've had a lot of that response from the residents as well. So just talking a bit about my hopes for the project. Um, my early perception of the project is that we try to create these communal spaces and try to tell the important tangible uh, stories of experience which were created within these spaces. It is likely that this will use augmented reality sort of to juxtapos juxtapose the current site within the early one. Uh, this idea has received strong enthusiasm from the residents so far, but as I say, I'm, I'm open to choosing something that everyone will get behind and that, so I'm not actually concluding with that so far. But in doing this, I hope that the immersive and interactive elements of the software will have an effective response on the viewer and engage them in thinking about these communal spaces and the importance of them within the site and that that community to ultimately thrive does need those spaces to create its own sense of identity and to try and pick apart the previous identities in the site because the current residents st have to take on the other identity from the previous park hills, if that makes sense, because th that is a living heritage site. And so that in th all those intangible elements are still sort of caught up in that. So it's, it's very complex. Um, and through this, I want to look at the intrinsic link between intangible heritage and tangible heritage. And I would like to spark a wider discussion surrounding whether communities can thrive without these tangible places and whether digital software itself can facilitate placemaking in, in place of tangible spaces. So can we create a, a digi some digital software where people can disseminate and, and collect their stories together and a shared history can be created within that? And can that be used to, to in places of, of the, an actual visitor centre for now? So that's, that's one element of it. Um, 
but also I think it would be an interesting way to strengthen the current community and as I say bring it into the fold the shared history of the place and a platform to disseminate the stories and by giving this community the power to sh uh, shape how this knowledge is presented I hope so add to notions of regional identity and cultural heritage. The current community does have some residents who lived at Park Hill prior to the urban splash uh, intervention, uh, but many do not, many have moved on. A particular challenge will be to achieve a di a di as diverse a project as possible, while at the same time trying to create something that is of use to the current residents. Um, so another hope for the project is that I would hope to shine a light on the, more, uh, the need for more communal spaces at Park Hill and play an active role in pushing back to the developers like Urban Splash uh, to create a community centre or a visitor centre for the future. And while Urban Splash have done a fantastic job so far, the integral vision of this site is community. And that was uh, implicit from what the architects were saying from the very beginning. They wanted a site that was going to sort of bring together the community that was part of the previous Victorian um, slums. And I think that's really important. Um, these early findings have, have been the result of working closely with the residents and listening to the ideas and needs. In doing this, I am hoping to create something that can make a difference for the community of Park Hill. Um, and furthermore, from a conservation perspective, it would be useful to have a record of these spaces which have been demolished, uh, be this in a 3D model or providing a consolidated and accessible video footage. The current listing information places little weight on these communal spaces, particularly uh, the play areas. Um, and I think that uh, this would so uh, in this way, I would hope to push to, the, to have the listing information revised to reflect the importance of these spaces. Um, so just to conclude, uh, to bring this talk to a conclusion, we've discussed our work at Park Hill and the use of technology. Uh, while technological approaches have not always been successful in this kind of community engagement, we would like to suggest uh, the following key considerations and questions for future engagements. Uh, considerations would be: it needs to be driven by what the community will want to use. It needs to be. Uh, it needs to uh, provide longevity, and it, it needs to make sure it tells the right stories of uh, that properly reflect the needs of the community um, and their ideas of place. I think the difficult, the difficulty will be, as I say, merging those three distinct periods where there's a contrast in 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 what constitutes place and identity, and I think that's something that that's going to be difficult in my role as a facilitator. But uh, hopefully, we can work with. A diverse range of, of residents and, and locals and bring that together. Uh, so my questions would be how can we incorporate this type of intangible heritage um, and bring everything together? So yeah, so that's my project. Thank you.